Hello everybody and how are you? It's a lovely windy day here in New Zealand and so you are probably going to get the noise of my, the wind in my chimney which is just one of those things that happened happen? not happened sorry past tense I've just been climbing up the stairs so I'll just catch my breath before I get going and how are you? What have you been up to? Anything interesting in your part of the world? wherever it is that you are. I hope that you're having a lovely time at the moment. I hope that if you are in lockdown you have some interesting things that you like doing to keep you happy and healthy. Um, and if you aren't in lockdown I hope that life is treating you well. Yes, that's it. Excuse me, just burping for a minute. Anyway, so I'm here, I'm Jev, I read stories to you um, and I read old-fashioned stories, ones that are in public domain largely and the intention for me originally was just to keep the poor children in lockdown, in our first lockdown here in New Zealand, give them something to do, something to watch, something to pay attention to that otherwise they wouldn't have a chance to do. Um, especially for those poor mums and dads who were getting nagged because the kids wanted something to do and they'd seen everything on TV and all those other sorts of things. So I really felt that it was more just a way of giving back to people when everybody was having a bit of a hard time during our first lockdown. So I have just, I ended up, sorry, I'm just moving my chair because it keeps skating backwards and I'm trying to wiggle it sideways so that it uh, the wheels turn and it does rotate sideways so it doesn't want to skate quite so much. Anyway, so here we go. Um, so I started by reading the Millie Molly Mandy stories, which is a wee while ago now. I started in March last year, so that's March, April, May, June, July, August, September. 18 months. I did take a break after our first lockdown. Um, but I got back into it again because I actually had friends saying when are you going to be reading us some more stories we really really enjoyed it and I think the reminder for them about the stories was because at the time I didn't have all of the Millie Money Mandy stories available to me to read um, here at home because I had just been reading the actual books that I had here at home um, most of my books at the moment are stuck in boxes unfortunately um, but what I did have and I realized later on was that I could access them through our local library system as an ebook and so I did that and I continued reading those stories which is a great way to go um, so if you can't get a book through your local library system another way to do it is to see if it's available especially if it's an old book through somewhere like Project Gutenberg which has a website which is this I shall type the name of the website here for you G-U-T-E-N-B-E-R-G dot org. There you go. And that is a way for you to actually have a look at books that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. So it's because a lot of old books are no longer in the library systems because libraries try to bring into their systems new books because other so that people who otherwise can't afford a book can actually read a book or people who don't necessarily want to end up with lots and lots of books but do enjoy reading that's what libraries are for um, so one of the things that that, um, that that's a big part of why libraries actually exist how they work and it means that people can access books and with the advent of ebooks it means that even during lockdowns we still have access to being able to read things which is fabulous I love that people can still get something different to read after they've finished the one that they've already got even if they're stuck at home in lockdown and they can't go and actually um, be in contact with somebody else and get them and that sort of thing so I ended up reading, hello, I've just heard that my, head, I'm just going to turn the sound off on my other headset. 
when I find the right cable for it, which is here. There you go, that's better because my microphone picks up on the other headset which isn't really a good idea and because my headset was hearing me talking um, we don't want feedback as in the buzzy ringy repetitive sound that you get sound wise <sighs> Millie Molly Mandy so I read the rest of the Millie Molly Mandy stories by borrowing them from the library as ebooks and because it was a long time after we'd actually had our first lockdown um, I actually had some friends who hadn't realised I'd been reading during lockdown because they were really busy with other things who then discovered that here are some ways of listening to books that aren't necessarily traditional audio books. So, you're here, you're listening to me reading stories and I would just like to say these are not your bought audio book style readings. These are rough reads, these are as they come. I make mistakes when I'm reading, I mispronounce things, I get confused sometimes with the emphasis in a sentence because often old books use words in a slightly different manner to how we use them these days. And so it's not until you've actually read through a story that you actually grasp the emphasis points within a sentence. Um, so anyway, doesn't matter. I've talked long enough. It's now time to read. So before I start, have you got something to drink so you don't get dehydrated? Have you got a nice snack to nibble on to keep you otherwise occupied while you're listening? And do you have somewhere nice and comfortable to sit or lie down while you're reading? Because those are part of listening to stories. And if you want to listen to them as bedtime stories, all good. You can also listen to other stories that I've previously read over on YouTube. That's if you're not. I'm saying over on YouTube because I'm reading this on Twitch live. Um, but I will be putting this story along with other ones over on my YouTube channel, which you will find in the information below. And I will type it in some other time, not right now. So I am going to start reading for you. And I am reading The Would Be Goods by Edith Nesbitt. And it is a sequel to a book called The Story of the Treasure Seekers, which we have previously completed. This chapter that I'm reading is called Chapter 9, Hunting the Fox. Now just a wee tip, these children are the bastable children. They have a tendency to get into trouble, even if they are doing things in a well-meaning way. So let's see what trouble they get into today. Chapter 9, the hunting, uh, Hunting the Fox. It is idle to expect everyone to know everything in the world without being told. If we had been brought up in the country, we, we would have known that it is not done to hunt the fox in August. But in the Lewisham Road, which is where they had been living previously, the most observing boy does not notice the dates when it is proper to hunt foxes. Which doesn't actually happen these days, but back when this was written it did. Um, foxes being something that could be a problem for farmers and so therefore it was considered okay to hunt them. Anyway, I shall carry on. This is not a moral story about how they used to do things badly and now we don't do things badly because we still do actually. This is actually just reading an old-fashioned story so I shall continue. And there are some things you cannot bear to think that anybody would think you would do. That is why I wish to state plainly at the very beginning that none of us would have shot a fox on purpose even to save our skins. Of course, if a man were at bay in a cave and had to defend girls from the simultaneous attack of a herd of savage foxes, it would be different. A man is bound to protect girls and take care of them. They can jolly well take care of themselves, really, it seems to me. Still, sorry, itchy. Still, this is what Uncle Albert's uncle calls one of the rules of the game, so we are bound to defend them and fight for them to the death if needful. Denny knows a quotation which says, What dire offence from harmless causes springs, What mighty contests rise from trefoil things. <coughs> he says this means that all great events come from three things, threefold, like the clover or trefoil, and the causes are always harmless. Trefoil is short for threefold. The story is being told to us by a young man called Oswald, Oswald, Ch um, Oswald Bastable, who tries to be 
well worded sometimes he overdoes it um, he will mimic the sort of things he has been reading and because this is an old-fashioned book as I just said the attitudes are not necessarily our attitudes they were considered a little bit ahead of their time when they were written but for this day and age a lot of those attitudes are a bit behind our times so just accept that that's how people used to think rather than getting upset or offended because they used to be different to how we are now they were still learning there are certainly three things that led up to the adventure which is now going to be told to you the first was our Indian uncle coming down to the country to see us the second was Denny's tooth the third was only our wanting to go hunting but if you count it, count it in, it makes the thing about the trefoil come right, and all these causes were harmless. It is a flattering thing to say, and it was not Oswald who said it, but Dora. She said she was certain our uncle missed us, and that he felt he could no longer live without seeing his dear ones. That was us. The Indian uncle is an English gentleman who had been living in India, who they now live with when they're living in the city. They're currently in the country, giving him a bit of a break because they're a little bit intense and he's not used to having children about. Anyway, he came down without warning, which is one of the few bad habits that excellent Indian, un Indian man has, and this habit has ended in unpleasantness more than once, as when we played jungles. However, this... That's actually why they're living in the country. You can listen to some previous chapters to find that one out. Start at the beginning of the book over on YouTube. However, this time it was all right. He came on rather a dull kind of day when no one had thought of anything particularly amusing to do. So that as it happened, so that as it happened to be dinner time and we had just washed our hands and faces, we were all spotlessly clean compared to what we are sometimes, I mean, of course. We were just sitting down to dinner and Albert's uncle was just plunging the knife into the hot heart of the steak pudding when there was the rumble of wheels and the station fly stopped at the garden gate. And in the fly, which is a type of coach, carriage, um, cart, that sort of thing, it was used for bringing things from the station and taking them to the station, such as luggage. And in the fly, sitting very upright with his hands on his knees, was our Indian relative, so much beloved. He looked very smart, with a rose in his buttonhole. How different from what he looked in other days when he helped us to pretend that our current pudding was a wild boar which we were killing with our forks. Yet, though tidier, his heart still beat kind and true. You should not judge people harshly because their clothes are tidy. He had dinner with us and then we showed him round the place and told him everything we thought he would like to hear and about the Tower of Mystery, see another previous chapter, and he said, it makes my blood boil to think of it. Because they had been locked up in the tower. You really need to listen to that chapter. Go on, head over to YouTube, see if it's yet been loaded there. Because they don't come up there straight away. They come after, the, after I've read them here for a while. Check out the playlist for the Would Be Goods book. Sorry, I'm just rearranging something on my desk so I can read my book without it getting in the way. Um, and have a listen to that one. So that was, where do we get up to? You should not judge people harshly because their clothes are tidy. He had dinner with us and then we showed him round the place and told him everything we thought he would like to hear and about the Tower of Mystery. And he said, it makes my blood boil to think of it. Noel said he was sorry for that because everyone else we had told it to had owned when we asked them that it froze their blood Ah, said the uncle, but in India we learn how to freeze our blood and boil it at the same time. So he is actually quite an, uh, an interesting, a neat, responsive sort of an adult, which was unusual in this day and age that this is written. In those hot longitudes, perhaps, the blood is always near boiling point, which accounts for Indian tempers, though not for the curry and pepper they eat. But I must not wander. There is no curry at all in this story. About temper, I will not say. Hmm. Then Uncle let us all go with him to the station when the fly came back for him, and when we said goodbye, he tipped us all half a quid without any insidi insidious distinctions about age or considering whether you were a boy or a girl. 
our Indian uncle is a true-born Briton, with no nonsense about him. We cheered him like one man as the train went off, and then we offered the fly driver a shilling to take us back to our four crossroads. And the grateful creature did it for nothing, because he said the gent had tipped him something like, similar to what they'd been receiving, how scarce is true gratitude. So we cheered the driver too for this rare virtue, and then went home to talk about what we should do with our money. I cannot tell you all that we did with it, because money melts away like snow wreaths in Thor Jean, as Denny says, and somehow the more you have, the more it quickly melts. We all went into Maidstone and came back with the most beautiful lot of brown paper parcels, with things inside that supplied long-felt wants. But none of them belongs to this narration, except what Oswald and Denny clubbed to buy. I'm just going to give you an aside here. Sorry, I'm about to plug my phone in. That's why the cord's wobbling around in the way. Um, Maidstone. Look that up on a map and you'll see where the story, the general area that the story is set. Which part of England that it is set in. Um, which will give you some idea of the sort of climate and, and countryside that they are in. It's nice to find out about places. So there you go. Have a look for Maidstone on a map of England. And then you'll see where they are. Yes, you will. I've nearly got my phone all sorted out with being plugged in. I just need it to unlock. Right, here we go. It's now working and my phone will stay awake because it's plugged in instead of going to sleep to save battery. That's the thing. Just need to prop it up here somewhere so I can see it. Right, here we go. <sighs> Carrying on. Sorry for that interruption. Maidstone, yes. You've, you're going to look that one up. I hope you wrote it down so you can remember later on. Because sometimes you need something outside of your brain to be, help you to remember. Sorry. But none of us, this belongs to this narration, what they spent their money on and their brown paper parcels, except what Oswald and Denny clubbed to buy. That means they put their money together to buy it. This was a pistol, and it took all the money they both had. But when Oswald felt the uncomfortable inside sensation that reminds you who it is, and his money, who it is and his money that are soon parted, he said to himself, I don't care. We ought to have a pistol in the house, and one that will go off too, not those rotten flintlocks. Suppose there should be burglars, and us totally unarmed. In the previous book, they had had a burglar. In fact, they'd had two burglars, kind of. Anyway, we'll carry on. We took it in turns to have the pistol, and we decided always to practice with it far from the house, so as not to frighten the grown-ups, who are always much nervouser about firearms than we are. It was Denny's idea getting it, and Oswald owns it surprised him. But the boy was much changed in his character. We got it while the others were grubbing at the pastry cooks in the high street. Grubbing, getting food, grub. And we said nothing till after tea, though it was hard not to fire at the birds on the telegraph wires as we came home in the train. It's possibly an air pistol, an air gun, but I'm not sure because I'm not sure what was allowed at, that, at the era that this is written which is around the turn of the 19th to 20th century. After tea, we called a council in the straw loft, and Oswald said, Denny and I have got a secret. I know what it is, Dickie said contemptibly. You found out that shop in Maidstone where peppermint rock is four ounces a penny. H.O. and I found it before you did. I'm guessing that that's actually a very good price for made, um, peppermint rock. Oswald said, you shut up. If you don't want to hear the secret, you'd better bunk. I'm going to administer the secret oath. Oh, I do have a mouthful of coffee left. I'm sorry, I have ADHD. I get very easily distracted. I manage to keep reading, but I do notice things. And to let you know what's going on, I will try and tell you what's going on. So you don't just think that's a bit weird. Anyway, I shall carry on reading. I shall, I'm going to administer the sacred, the secret oath. This is a very solemn oath and only used about real things and never for pretending ones, so Dickie said. So Dickie said, 
Oh, all right, go ahead. I thought you were only rotting, telling stories. So they all took the secret oath. Noel made it up long before when he had found the first thrush's nest we ever saw in the Blackheath garden. I will not tell, I will not reveal, I will not touch or try to steal, and may I be called a beastly sneak if this great secret I ever repeat. It's a little wrong about the poetry, but it is a very binding promise. They all repeated it, down to H.O. H.O.'s the youngest. Now then, Dickie said, what's up? Oswald, in proud silence, drew the pistol from his breast. That's the pocket inside his shirt or his jacket. And held it out, and there was a murmur of awful amazement and respect from every one of the council. The pistol was not loaded, so we let even the girls have it to look at. And then, and then Dickie said, let's go hunting. And we decided that we would. H.O. wanted to go down to the village and get penny horns at the shop for the huntsman to what? Shop. At, get penny horns at the shop for the huntsman to wind. That means blowing the horns. Da 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 da. When you're hunting something. Like in the song, but we thought it would be more modest not to wind horns or anything noisy, at any rate, not until we had run down our prey. But his talking of the song made us decide that it was the fox we wanted to hunt. We had not been particular with which animal we had hunted before that. Oswald let Denny have first go with the pistol, and when we went to bed he slept with it under his pillow, but not loaded, for fear he should have a nightmare and draw his fell weapon before he was properly awake. That would have been quite dangerous. Oswald let Denny have it because Denny had a toothache, and the pistol is consoling, though it does not actually stop the pain of the tooth. The toothache got worse, and Albert's uncle looked at it and said it was very loose, and Denny owned he had tried to crack a peach stone with it which accounts. He had creosote and camphor and went to bed early with his tooth tied up in red flannel. Creosote and camphor were used as a, um, a toothache medicine. I'm not quite sure how they were administered. Tooth tied up in red flannel. Uh, red flannel is brushed cotton. We refer to it in New Zealand as either flannelette or winsiet. Um, Americans, I think, refer to it as flannel. Um, whereas a flannel in New Zealand, a flannel in New Zealand is a face washing cloth and it's made out of looped fabric, not out of brushed fabric. Uh, red flannel was commonly used for a lot of things, such as girls' petticoats, as we found out in the book The Railway Children by the same author. And I think they've used it also in this book, one of the girls' petticoats. Um, and because it's soft, and, and strong enough, um, it gets used for all sorts of things like wrapping things up, binding things as, as a temporary bandage. Um, red flannel, wrapping the tooth in red flannel would not be in your mouth with red flannel, I don't think. It's probably around the head, like you see Victorian pictures of someone with a toothache with their head all bound up. Um, and the reality is it stops you chewing things when you shouldn't and, and poking in your mouth, which makes it worse. But also, it keeps your face warm, because houses weren't heated like they are now. It keeps your face warm if the, if the air around you is cold, and often heat is what stops, uh, eases the ache in teeth when they have a problem, such as being cracked, which would be quite sore. Mm. Anyway, so I'm going to carry on now. Uh, where did I get up to? He had creosote and camphor and went to bed early with his tooth tied up in red flannel. Oswald knows it is right to be very kind when people are ill, and he forbore to wake the sufferer next morning by buzzing a pillow at him, as he generally does. He got up and went over to shake the invalid, but the bird had flown and the nest was cold. The pistol was not in the nest either, but Oswald found it afterwards under the looking glass on the dressing table. He had just awakened the others with a hairbrush because they had not got anything the matter with their teeth, when he heard wheels and looking out beheld Denny and Albert's uncle being driven from the door in the farmer's high cart with the red wheels. We dressed extra quick so as to get downstairs to the bottom of the mystery. And we found a note from Albert's uncle. 
it's his place in the country that they're staying at, well the place that he rents in the country that they're staying at. It was addressed to Dora, who's the oldest, and said, Denny's toothache got him up in the small hours. He's off to the dentist to have it out with him. Man to man, home to dinner. Dora said, Denny's gone to the dentist. I expect it's a relation, H.O. said. Denny must be short for dentist. H.O.'s the youngest, remember. I suppose he was trying to be funny. He really does try very hard. He wants to be a clown when he grows up. The others laughed. I wonder, said Dicky, whether he'll get a shilling or a half crown for it when you lose a tooth. Oswald had been meditating in gloomy silence. Now he cheered up and said, Of course, I'd forgotten that. He'll get his tooth money and the drive too. So it's quite fair for us to have the fox hunt while he's gone. I was thinking we should have to put it off. The others agreed it would not be unfair. We can have another one another time if he wants to, Oswald said. We know foxes are hunted in red coats and on horseback, but we could not do this. But H.O. had the old red football jersey that was Albert's uncle's when he was at Loretto. He was pleased. But I do wish we had horns, he said grievingly. Wish I should have liked to wind the horn. We can pretend horns, Dora said. But he answered, I didn't want to pretend I wanted to wind something. Wind your watch. Wind your horn. Wind. They're written the same way. I've always heard it as wind because you blow them. Wind your horn. I don't know. Sorry, I'm going to keep calling it wind. Wind your watch, Dickie said, and that was unkind because we all know H HO's watch is broken and when you wind it, it only rattles inside without going in the least. Sounds like someone's overwound it already. We did not bother to dress up much for the hunting expedition, just cocked hats and lath swords. Lath is a type of thin board that is used to make the lining on a wall frame before it's plastered over, back in the days before they had plasterboard, to become a wall surface. So lath is a thin board that's about oh, an inch or two, two and a half centimetres wide, um, probably about a quarter of an inch thick, five millimetres thick, maybe. Ideal for pretending swords with, anyway. Um, lath swords. Now I need to find where it is in my book. We did not bother to dress up much for the hunting expedition, just cocked hats and lath swords, and we tied a card onto H.O.'s chest with Moat House Fox Hunters on it, and we tied red flannel round all the dogs' necks to show that they were foxhounds. Yet it did not seem to show it plainly. Somehow it made them look as if they were not foxhounds, but their own natural breeds, only with sore throats. Remember what I said about the tooth with the red flannel? Bandage around the head? Yes, red flannel used to be put around people's necks when they had a sore throat for the same reason, keep it warm. Oswald slipped the pistol and a few cartridges into his pocket, so it's not a slug gun. He knew, of course, that foxes are not shot, but as he said, who knows whether we may not meet a bear or a crocodile. We set off gaily, across the orchard and through two cornfields and along the hedge to another field, and so we got into the wood through a gap we had happened to make a day or two before, playing follow my leader. The wood was very quiet and green. The dogs were happy and most busy. Once Pincher started a rabbit. We said view halloo and immediately started in pursuit. But the rabbit went and hid so that even Pincher could not find him and we went on. But we saw no foxes. So at last we made Dicky be a fox and chased him down the green rides. A wide walk in a wood is called a ride, even if people never do anything but walk in it. We had only three hounds, Lady, Pincher and Martha, so we gathered the, so we joined the glad throng and were being hounds as hard as we could when we suddenly came barking round a corner in full chase and stopped short, for we saw that our fox had stayed his hasty flight. The fox was stooping over something reddish that lay beside the path and he cried, I say, look here, in tones that thrilled us throughout. Our fox, whom we, whom we must now call Dicky, so as not to muddle the narration, pointed to the ready thing that the dogs were sniffing at. It's a real live fox, he said, and so it was. At least it was real, only it was quite dead, and when Oswald lifted up its head, it was bleeding. 
It had evidently been shot through the brain and expired instantly. Oswald explained this to the girls when they began to cry at the sight of the poor beast. I do not say he did not feel a bit sorry himself. The fox was cold, but its fur was so pretty in its tail and its little feet. Dickie strung the dogs on the leash. They were so much interested we thought it was better to keep them under control. It does seem horrid to think it'll never see again out of its poor little eyes, Dora said, blowing her nose, and never run about through the wood again. Lend me your hanky, Dora, said Alice, and never be hunted or get into a hen roost or trap or anything exciting. Poor little thing, said Dicky. The girls began to pick green chestnut leaves to cover the poor fox's fatal wound, and Noel began to walk up and down making faces, the way he does when he's making poetry. He cannot make one without the other. It works both ways, which is a comfort. I think that means that they can tell when he's making poetry. <laughs> I'm not sure what other purpose that statement would have been had. What are we going to do now, H.O. said. The huntsman ought to cut off its tail, I'm quite certain, only I've broken the big blade of my knife, and the other never was any good. The girls gave H.O. a shove, and even Oswald said, shut up, for something, for somehow we felt that we did not want to play fox hunting any more that day. When his deadly wound was covered, the fox hardly looked dead at all. Oh, I wish it wasn't true, Alice said. Daisy had been crying all the time, and now she said, I would like to pray God to make it not true. But Dora kissed her and told her that that was no good, only she might pray to God to take care of the fox's poor little babies, if it had any, which I believe she has done ever since prayed for the fox's babies. If only we could wake up and find it was a horrid dream, Alice said. It seems silly that we should have cared so much when we re had really set out to hunt foxes with dogs, but it is true. The fox's feet looked so helpless, and there was a dusty mark on its side that I know would not have been there if it had been alive and able to wash itself. Noel now said, here is the piece of poetry. Here lies poor Reynard, who is slain. He will not come to life again. I never will the huntsman's horn wind since the day that I was born, until the day I die, for I do not like hunting, and this is why. Let's have a funeral, said H.O. This pleased everybody, and we got Dora to take off her petticoat to wrap the fox in, so that we could carry it to our garden and bury it without bloodying our jackets. Girls' clothes are silly in one way, but I think they are useful too. A boy cannot take off more than his jacket and waistcoat in any emergency, or he is at once entirely undressed. But I have known D Dora take off two petticoats for useful purposes and look just the same outside afterwards. We took it in turns to carry the fox. It was very heavy. When we got near the edge of the wood, Noel said it would be better to bury it here, where the leaves can talk funeral songs over its grave forever, and the other foxes can come and cry if they want to. He dumped the fox down on the moss under a young oak tree as he spoke. If Dickie fetched the spade and fork, we could bury it here, and then he could, he could tie up the dogs at the same time. You're sick of carrying it, Dickie remarked. That's what it is. But he went, on condition the rest of us boys went too. While we were gone, the girls dragged the fox to the edge of the wood. It was a different edge to the one we went in by, close to a lane. And while they were waiting for the digging or fatigue party to come back, they collected a lot of moss and green things to make the fox's long home soft for it to lie in. There are no flowers in the woods in August, which is a pity. When we, that's because it's the middle of summer in England at the time and, and the sort of woodland flowers that you get are spring flowers. When we got back with the spade and fork, we dug a hole to bury the fox in. We did not bring the dogs back because they were too interested in the funeral to behave with real, respectable calmness. The ground was loose and soft and easy to dig when we were, had scraped away the broken bits of sticks and dead leaves and the wild honeysuckle. Oswald used the fork and Dickie had the spade. Noel made faces in poetry. He was struck so much so that he was struck so that morning, and the girl sat stroking the clean parts of the fox's fur till the grave was deep enough. At least it was. At last it was. Then Daisy threw in the leaves and grass, and Alice and Dora took the poor dead fox by his two ends, and we helped to put him in the grave. 
We could not lower him slowly. He was dropped in, really. Then we covered the furry body with leaves, and Noel said, that, said the burial ode he had made up. He says this was it, but it sounds better now than it did then, so I think he must have done something to it since. The Fox's Burial Ode Dear Fox, sleep here and do not wake. We pick these leaves for your sake. We must not try to rise or move. We give you this with our love. Close by the wood where once you grew, your mournful friend, morning friends have buried you. If you had lived, you would, you'd not have been, been proper friends with us, I mean. But now you're laid upon the shelf. Poor Fox, you cannot help yourself. So as I say, we are your loving friends and here your burial ode, dear Foxy, ends. P.S. When the moonlight bright, when in the moonlight bright, the foxes wander of a night, they'll pass your grave and fondly think of you, exactly like we mean to always do. And now, dear fox, adieu. Your friends are few, but true to you. Adieu. When this had been said, we filled in the grave and covered the top of it with dry leaves and sticks to make it look like the rest of the wood. People might think it was a treasure and dig it up if they thought there was anything buried there, and we wished the poor fox to sleep sound and not be disturbed. The interring was over. We folded up Dora's blood-stained pink cotton petticoat and turned to leave the sad spot. We had not gone a dozen yards down the lane when we heard footsteps and a whistle behind us, and a scrabbling and whining and a gentleman with two fox terriers had, just, had called a halt just by the place where we had laid low the little red rover. The gentlemen stood in the lane, but the dogs were digging. We could see their tails wagging and see the dust fly. And we saw where. We ran back. Oh, please do stop your dogs digging there, Alice said. The gentleman asked why. Because we've just had a funeral and that's the grave. The gentleman whistled, but the fox terriers were not trained like Pincher, who, had brought, who was brought up by Oswald. The gentleman took a stride through the hedge gap. What have you been burying, pet dicky bird, eh? said the gentleman kindly. He had riding breeches and white whiskers. We did not answer because now for the first time it came over all of us in a rush of blushes and uncomfortableness that burying a fox is a suspicious act. I don't know why we felt this, but we did. Noel said dreamily, we found his murdered body in the wood and dug a grave by which the mourners stood. But no one heard him except Oswald because Alice and Dora and Daisy were all jumping about with the jumps of unrestrained anguish and saying, I'll call them off. Do, do. Oh, don't, don't, don't let them dig. Alas, Oswald was, as usual, right. The ground of the grave had not been trampled down hard enough and he had said so plainly at the time. But his prudent counsels had been overruled and now these busy-bodying, meddling, mischief-making fox terriers how different from Pincher, who minds his own business unless told otherwise, had scratched away the earth and laid bare the reddish tip of the poor corpse's tail. We all turned to go without a word. It seemed to be no use staying any longer. But in a moment, the gentleman with the whiskers had got Noel and Dickie each by an ear. They were nearest to him. H.O. hid in the hedge. Oswald, to whose noble breast sneakishness is, I am thankful to say, a stranger, would have scorned to escape, but he ordered his sisters to bunk in a tone of command which made refusal impossible. And bunk sharp too, he added sternly, cut along home. So they cut. The white-whiskered gentleman now encouraged his angry fox terriers by every means at his command to continue their vile and degrading occupation, holding on all the time to the ears of Dickie and Noel, who scorned to ask for mercy. Dickie got purple and Noel got white, it was Oswald who'd said, Don't hang on to them, sir. We won't cut. I give you my word of honour. Your word of honour, said the gentleman, in tones for which in happier days when people drew their bright blades and fought duels, I would have had his heart's dearest blood. But now Oswald remained calm and polite as ever. Yes, on my honour, he said, and the gentleman dropped the ears of Oswald's brothers at the sound of his firm, unswerving tones. He dropped the ears and pulled out the body of the fox and held it up. The dogs jumped up and yelled. Now, he said, you talk very big words about honour. Can you speak the truth? Dickie said. If you think we shot it, you're wrong. We know better than that. The white-whiskered one turned suddenly to H.O. and pulled him out of the hedge. 
And what does that mean, he said, and he was pink with fury to the ends of his large ears, as he pointed to the card on H.O.'s breast, which said, Moat House Fox Hunters. Then Oswald said, we were playing at fox hunting, but we couldn't find anything but a rabbit that hid, so my brother was being the fox, and then we found the fox shot dead, and I don't know who did it, and we're sorry for it. We were sorry for it and buried it, and that is all. Not quite, said the riding breeches gentleman, with what I think you call a bitter smile. Not quite. This is my land, and I'll have you up for trespass and damage. Come along now, no nonsense. I'm a magistrate, and I'm master of the hounds. A vixen, too. What did you shoot her with? You're too young to have a gun. Sneaked your father's revolver, I suppose. Oswald thought it better to be goldenly silent, but it was vain. The master of the hounds made him empty his pockets, and there was the pistol and the cartridges. The magistrate laughed a harsh laugh of successful disagreeableness. All right, he said, where's your license? You come with me, a week or two in prison. I don't believe now he could have done it, but we all thought that then that he could and would, what's more. So H.O. began to cry, but Noel spoke up. His teeth were chattering, but he spoke up like a man. He said, you don't know us. You've no right not to believe us till you've found us out in a lie. We don't tell lies. You ask Albert's uncle if we do. Hold your tongue, said the white whiskered. But Noel's blood was up. If you do put us in prison without being sure, he said, trembling more and more, you are a horrible tyrant like Caligula and Herod or Nero and the Spanish Inquisition. I will write a poem about it in prison and people will curse you forever. Upon my word, said White Whiskers, we'll see about that. And he turned up the lane with the fox hanging from one hand, one hand and Noel's ear once more reposing in the other. I thought Noel would cry or faint, but he bore it up he bore up nobly, exactly like an early Christian martyr. The rest of us came along too. I carried the spade and Dickie had the fork. H O had the card and Noel had the magistrate. At the end of the lane there was Alice. She had bunked home, obeying the orders of her thoughtful brother, but she had bottled back again like a shot, so as not to be out of the scrape. She is almost worthy to be a boy for some things. She spoke to Mr. Magistrate and said, Where are you taking him? The outraged majesty of the magistrate said, To prison, you naughty little girl. Alice said, Noel will faint. Somebody once tried to take him to prison before about a dog. Do please come to our house and see our uncle. At least he's not, but it's the same thing. He's not actually their uncle. We didn't kill the fox, if that's what you think. Indeed we didn't. Oh dear, I do wish you'd think of your own little boys and girls if you've got any, or else about when you were little. You wouldn't be so horrid if you did. I don't know which, if either of these objects, the foxhound master thought of, but he said, well, lead on. And he let go of Noel's ear, and Alice snuggled up to Noel and put her arm around him. It was a frightening procession, those whose cheeks... Frightened procession, whose cheeks were pale with alarm, except those between white whiskers, and they were red. That wound that that wound in at our gate, the procession, wound in at our gate, and into the hall among the old oak furniture and black and white marble floor and things. Dora and Daisy were at the door. The pink petticoat lay on the table, all stained with the gore of the departed. Dora looked at us all, and she saw it was serious. She pulled out the big oak chair and said, Won't you sit down? Very kindly to the white-whiskered magistrate. He grunted, but did as she said. Then he looked about him in a silence that was not comforting, and so did we. At last he said, Come, you didn't try to bolt. Speak the truth and I'll say no more. We said we had. Then he laid the fox on the table, spreading out the petticoat under it, and he took out a knife, and the girls hid their faces. Even Oswald did not care to look. Wounds in battle are all very well, but it's different to see a dead fox cut in two with a knife. Next moment, the magistrate wiped something on his handkerchief, then laid it on the table and put one of my cartridges beside it. It was the bullet that had killed the fox. Look here, he said, and it was too true. The bullets were the same. A thrill of despair ran through Oswald. He knows now how a hero feels when he is innocently accused of a crime and the judge is putting on the black cap and the evidence is convulsive. 
he means conclusive, and all human aid is despaired of. I can't help it, he said. We didn't kill it, and that's all there is to it. The white-whiskered magistrate may have been master of the foxhounds, but he was not master of his temper, which is more important. I should think, which is more important, I should think, than a lot of beastly dogs. He said several words which Oswald would never repeat, much less in his own conversing. And besides, he called us obstinate little beggars. Then suddenly Albert's uncle entered the mid in the midst of a silence freighted, freighted with despairing reflections. These are Oswald's words, remember. He's not necessarily the best at knowing what, re what words he's meant to be using. He'll often use ones he thinks he's meant to be using. Freighted, I think he means fraught, with despairing reflections. The MFH got up and told his tale. It was mainly lies, or to be more polite, it was hardly any of it true, though I suppose he believed it. I am very sorry, sir, said Albert's uncle, looking at the bullets. You'll excuse my asking for the children's version. That's Albert's uncle. Oh, certainly, sir, certainly, fuming, fuming the oxhound magis uh, foxhound magistrate replied. Then Albert's uncle said, Now, Oswald, I know I can trust you to speak the exact truth. So, Oswald did. Then the white-whiskered foxmaster laid the bullets before Albert's uncle, and I felt this would be a trial of his faith far worse than the rack or the thumbscrews in the days of the Armada. And then Denny came in. He looked at the fox on the table. You found it then, he said. The MFH would have spoken, but Albert's uncle said, One moment, Denny. You've seen this fox before? Rather, said Denny, I... But Albert's uncle said, Take time. Think before you speak and say the exact truth. No, don't whisper to Oswald. This boy, he said to the injured fox master, has been with me since seven this morning. His tale, whatever it is, will be independent evidence. But Denny would not speak, though again and again Albert's uncle told him to. I can't till I've asked Oswald something, he said at last. White Whiskers said, that looks bad, eh? But Oswald said, don't whisper, old chap. Ask me whatever you like, but speak up. So Denny said, I can't without breaking the secret oath. Then Oswald began to see, and he said, break away for all you're worth. It's all right. And Denny said, drawing relief's deepest breath, well then, Oswald and I have got a pistol, shares, and I had it last night. And when I couldn't sleep last night because of the toothache, I got up and went out early this morning. And I took the pistol, and I loaded it just for fun. And down in the wood I heard a whining like a dog, and I went. And there was the poor fox caught in an iron trap with teeth. And I went to let it out, and it bit me. Look, here's the place. And the pistol went off, and the fox died, and I'm so sorry. But why didn't you tell the others? They weren't awake when I went to the dentist's. But why didn't you tell your uncle if you've been with him all the morning? It was the oath, H.O. said. May I be called a beastly sneak if this great secret I ever repeat? White Whiskers actually grinned. Well, he said, I see it was an accident, my boy. Then he turned to us and said, I owe you an apology for doubting your word, all of you. I hope it is accepted. We said it was all right, and he was to never mind. But all the same, we hated him for it. He tried to make up for his unbelievingness afterwards by asking Albert's uncle to shoot the rabbits. But we did not really forgive him till the day he sent the fox's brush to Alice, mounted in silver, with a note about her plucky conduct and standing by her brothers. We got a lecture about not playing with firearms but no punishment, because our conduct had not been exactly sinful. Albert's uncle said, but merely silly. The pistol and the cartridges were confiscated. I hope the house will never be under attack by burglars. When it is, Albert's uncle will ha only have himself to thank if we are rapidly overpowered, because it will be his fault that we shall have to meet them totally unarmed and be their almost unresisting prey. So there you go. It sounds like the person at the shop shouldn't have sold it to them. Maybe they said that they were buying it for an older relative, or they, the person in the shop assumed it. They're a lot tougher now with, with sale of firearms. So that's the end of that chapter, and I'm going to have a quick drink of something.
and you should too while you can and maybe shoot off to the loo in case you need to go um, before I read the next chapter which is called chap which is chapter 10 called the sale of antiquities and we'll find out what that is soon but I'm going to finish my coffee and then have a drink of water one tiny mouthful not much at all but better than none so there you go my poor computer it's overloaded again I'll shut one of my browser windows and we shall carry on right I'm having oh that's right I've also got my smoothie here so I'm going to carry on with that and let, maybe let my computer catch up mm. while we're waiting before we read I'm going to give you a couple of links when I click on the right box <laughs> I have a migraine at the moment and one of the things that happens with migraines is I get itchy especially my nose and I get too hot as well so if I'm a bit fidgety apart from me being ADHD you'll know why I'm a bit fidgety it's because of the itches and all the other things going on right so I hope you're back from the loo I hope you've had a nice drink while well, you can carry on drinking anyway it doesn't matter and snacking away and enjoying yourself in your nice comfortable seat I hope and we shall carry on reading I'm just looking across at my other monitor to see if there's anything happening I'm meant to be dealing with but no it looks okay here we go <clears throat> I'm reading I'm Jeff and I'm reading the would-be goods by Edith Nesbitt and this is chapter 10 the sale of antiquities it began, it began one morning at breakfast. It was the 15th of August, the birthday of Napoleon the Great, Oswald Bastable and another very nice writer. Oswald, the birthday of Napoleon the Great, Oswald Bastable and another very nice writer. I wonder who that is. You could look that up, the 15th of August. I think you'd be able to find out over on, what's it called? Wikipedia. They have a birthdays page on there. Oswald Bastable and another very nice writer. Oswald was to keep his birthday on the Saturday so that his father could be there. So they're not celebrating it on the actual 15th. A birthday when there are only many happy returns is like Sunday or Christmas Eve. Oswald had a birthday card or two and that was all. But he did not repine because he knew they always make up make it up to you for putting off keeping your birthday. And he looked forward to Saturday. Albert's uncle had a whole stack of letters as usual and presently he tossed one over to Dora and said, What do you say, little lady? Shall we let them come? But Dora, butterfingered as ever, missed the catch and Dick and Noel both had to try for it so that the letter went into the place where the bacon had been and where now only frozen looking, a frozen looking lake of bacon fat was slowly hardening and then somehow it got into the marmalade and then H.O. got it and Dora said, I don't want the nasty thing now, all grease and stickiness. So H.O. read it aloud. Maidstone Society of Antiquities and Field Club, August the 14th, 1900. Now you know when the story is set. Dear Sir, at a meeting of the H.O. stuck fast here and the writing was really very bad, like a spider had been in the ink pot crawling in a hurry over the paper without stopping to rub its feet properly on the mat. So Oswald took the letter, so H.O.'s the youngest, and he's probably not quite as skilled at reading cursive writing. Oswald took the letter. He was above minding a little marmalade or bacon. 
He began to read. It ran thus. It's not antiquities, you little silly, he said. It's antiquaries. The others are very good words, said Albert's uncle, and I never call names at breakfast myself. It upsets the digestion, my egregious Oswald. That's a name, though, said Alice, and you got it out of Storky, too. Go on, Oswald. So Storky's a reference to Storky and Co. by Rudyard Kipling. Obviously a popular book with the children at the time. So Oswald went on where he had been on where he had been interrupted. Maidstone Society of Antiquaries and Field Club, August 14, 1900. Dear Sir, at a meeting of the committee of this society, it was agreed that a field day should be held on August 20 when the society proposes to visit the interesting church of Ivy Bridge and also the Roman remains in the vicinity. Our president, Mr Longchamp, FRS, which means a fellow of the something or other society, Royal Society, I think, has obtained permission to open a barrow in the Three Trees pasture. We venture to ask whether you would allow the members of the society to walk through your grounds and to inspect, from without of course, your beautiful house, which is, as you are doubtless aware, of great historic interest, having been for some years the residence of the celebrated Sir Thomas Wyatt. I am, dear sir, yours faithfully, Edward K. Turnbull. Honorary Secretary. That's worth looking up, seeing if there really was a Sir Thomas Wyatt who lived near Maidstone in England, and you might be able to find out where this book is actually set in real life. Just so, said Albert's uncle. Well, shall we permit the eye of the Maidstone antiquities to profane these sacred solitudes and the foot of the field club to kick up a dust on our gravel? Our gravel's all grass, said H.O., and the girl said, oh, do let them come. It was Alice who said, why not ask them to tea? They'll be very tired coming all the way from Maidstone. I don't think they're actually walking. I think they're actually getting a ride. So they shouldn't be too bad. Would you really like it? Albert's uncle asked. I'm afraid they'll be but dull dogs, the antiquities. Stuffy old gentlemen with amphorae in their buttonholes instead of orchids. And pedigrees poking out of all their pockets. He's an author. He's a children's author, probably for older children. And I think he lets his imagination run away with him. We laughed because we knew what an amphorae is. If you don't, you might look it up in the dicker. That's the dictionary. It's not a flower, though it sounds like one out of the gardening book, the kind you never hear of anyone growing. Dora said she thought it would be splendid. And we could have out the best china, she said, and decorate the table with flowers. We could have tea in the garden. We've never had a party since we've been here. I warn you that your guests may be bother boresome, not bothersome, boresome. However, have it your own way, Albert's uncle said, and he went off to write the invitation to tea to the Maidstone Antiquities. I know that is the wrong word, but somehow we all used it whenever we spoke of them. Which was often. In a day or two, Albert's uncle came in to tea with a lightly clouded brow. That means he looked slightly worried or puzzled. You've let me in for a nice thing, he said. I asked the antiquities to tea and I asked casually how many we might expect. I thought we might need at least a f the full dozen of the best teacups. Now the secretary writes, accepting my kind invitation. Oh, good, we all cried. And how many are coming? Oh, only about sixty was the groaning rejoinder. Perhaps more, should the weather be exceptionally favourable. Though stunned at first, we presently decided that we were pleased. We had never, never given such a big party. The girls were allowed to help in the kitchen where Mrs Pettigrew made cakes all day long. Without stopping, they did not let us boys be there, though I cannot see any harm in putting your finger in a cake before it's baked, and then licking your finger, if you're careful to put a different finger in the cake next time. Cake before it is baked is delicious, like a sort of cream. Sorry, I'm just writing down the name of um, the place, Maidstone, to remind me to look up the location of the book, possibly. Albert's uncle said he was the prey of despair. He drove into Maidstone one day. When we asked him where he was going, he said, to get my hair cut. 
If I keep it this length, I shall certainly tear it out by double handfuls in the extremity of my anguish every time I think of those innumerable antiquities. But we found out afterwards that he really wanted to went to borrow china and things to give the antiquities their tea out of, though he did have his hair cut too, because he is the soul of truth and honour. Oswald had a very good sort of birthday, with bows and arrows as well as other presents. I think these were meant to make up for the pistol that was taken away after the adventure of the fox hunting. These gave us boys something to do between the birthday keeping, which was on the Saturday, and the Wednesday when the antiquities were to come. We did not allow the, girl, allow the girls to play with the bows and arrows because they had the cakes that we were cut off from. There was little or no unpleasantness over this. <laughs> for a change. On the Tuesday we went down to look at the Roman place where the antiquities were going to dig. We sat on the Roman wall and ate nuts. And as we sat there we saw coming through the beet field two labourers with picks and shovels and a very young man with thin legs and a bicycle. It turned out afterwards to be a free wheel, the first we had ever seen. One that the pedals are not fixed with the wheels. So one that you can coast downhill on and have your feet on the pedals without the pedals going around as fast as the bike was moving. So it's obviously a new thing for them. They stopped at a mound inside the garden wall and the men took their coats off and spat on their hand, hands. We went down at once of course. The thin-legged bicyclist explained his machine to us very fully and carefully when we asked him and then we saw the men were cutting turfs and turning them over and rolling them up and putting them in a heap. So we asked the gentleman with the thin legs what they were doing. He said, they are beginning the preliminary excavation in readiness for tomorrow. What's up tomorrow? H.O. asked. Tomorrow we propose to open this barrow and examine it. Then you're the antiquities, said H.O. I'm the secretary, said the gentleman, smiling, but narrowly. Obviously he didn't like being called an antiquity, which is an old thing, very old. So you're all coming to tea with us, Dora said and added anxiously. How many of you do you think there'll be? Oh, not more than 80 or 90, I should think, replied the gentleman. This took our breath away and we went home. As we went, Oswald, who notices many things that would pass unobserved by the light and the careless, saw Denny frowning hard. So he said, what's up? I've got an idea, the dentist said. Let's call a council. Oh dear, here comes trouble. Can you guess what they're going to do? I've got a bit of an idea. I'm not going to say anything. I'll try not to. I'll try to just read the story. Oh, the anticipation. The dentist had grown quite used to our ways now. We had called him the dentist ever since the fox hunt day. He called the council as if he had been used to calling such things all his life and having them come too, whereas we all know that his former existing was that of a white mouse in a trap, like a box trap, with that cat of a Murdstone aunt watching him through the bars. So obviously he's got quite used to being with the Bastable children. That is what is called a figure of speech, Albert's uncle told me. The, the depiction of him being like a white mouse, etc, etc. Councils are held in the straw loft. As soon as we were all there, and the straw had stopped rustling after our sitting down, Dickie said, I hope it's nothing to do with the would-be goods. No, said Denny in a hurry, quite the opposite. I hope it's nothing wrong, said Dora and Daisy together. It's, it's, hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, said Denny. I mean, I think it's what's called a lark. So obviously he's quoting a poem, which is referring to a lark. And a lark is a prank, something fun, whatever. The anticipation, oh, oh dear, oh dear. Ah, you never know your lark. Go on, dentist, said Dickie. Well then, do you know a book called The Daisy Chain? We didn't. It's by Miss Charlotte M. Yong. Daisy interrupted, and it's about a family of poor motherless children who tried so hard to be good, and they were confirmed, and had a bazaar, and went to the church at the Minster, that's the county main church, like a cathedral, and one of them got married and wore black watered silk and silver ornaments, so her baby died, and then she was sorry she had not been a good mother to it, and here Dickie got up and said he'd got some snares to attend to, and he'd receive a report of the council after it was all over. 
because the explanation of the story was more than they needed. But he only got as far as the trapdoor and then Oswald, the fleet of foot, closed with him and they rolled together on the floor while all the others called out, come back, come back, like guinea hens on a fence. Through the rustle and bustle and hustle of the struggle with Dickie, Oswald heard the voice of Denny murmuring one of his everlasting quotations. Come back, come back, he tr cried in Greek across the stormy water, and I'll forgive your highland cheek, my daughter, oh my daughter. When quiet was <laughs> totally irrelevant, but quoting. When quiet was restored Dick and Dickie had agreed to go through with the council, Denny said, The daisy chain is not a bit like that, really. It's a ripping book. One of the boys dresses up like a lady and comes to call, and another tries to hit his little sister with a hoe. It's jolly fine, I tell you. Denny is learning to say what he thinks, just like other boys. He would never have learnt such words as ripping and jolly fine while under the auntal tyranny. Since then I've read The Daisy Chain. It is a first-rate book for girls and little boys, but we did not want to talk about The Daisy Chain just then. So Oswald said, but what's your lark? Denny got pale pink and said, don't hurry me, I'll tell you directly, let me think a minute. Then he shut his pale pink eyelids a moment and thought, and then opened them up and stood up on the straw and said very fast, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. If not your ears, if not ears, pots. You know, Uncle Albert said that they were going to open the barrow to look for Roman remains tomorrow. Don't you think it seems a pity they shouldn't find any? Oh dear. Perhaps they will, Dora said, but Oswald said, saw, and he said, Primus, go ahead, old man. The dentist went ahead. In the daisy chain, he said, they dug in, the Roman in, a, in a Roman encampment, and the children went first and put some pottery there they'd made themselves, and Harry's old medal of the Duke of Wellington. The doctor helped them the doctor helped them to some stuff to partly efface the inscription, and all the grown ups were sold, as in they bought the lie of the stuff. I thought we might, you may break, you may shatter the vase if we will, but the scent of the Romans will cling round it still. That was him. Denny sat down amid applause. It really was a great idea, at least for him. It seemed to add just what was wanted to the visit of the Maidstone antiquities. To sell the antiquities thoroughly would be indeed splendiferous. Of course, Dora made haste to point out that we had not got an old medal of the Duke of Wellington, and that we hadn't any doctor who would help us to stuff to a face, and etc. But we sternly bade her to stow it. We weren't exact going to do exactly like those daisy chain kids. The pottery was easy. We had made a lot of it by the stream, which was the Nile when we discovered its source, and dried it in the sun and then baked it under a bonfire, like in Foul Play, another book or a story or a song, and most of the things were such queer shapes that they should have done for almost anything, Roman or Greek or even Egyptian or antediluvian, whatever that is, or household milk jugs of the cavemen, Albert's uncle said. The pots were fortunately quite ready and dirty because we had already buried them in mixed sand and river mud to improve the colour and not remembered to wash it off. So the council at once collected it all and some rusty hinges and some brass buttons and a file without a handle and the girl councillors carried it all concealed in their pinafores while the men members carried digging tools. H.O. and Daisy were sent on ahead as scouts to see if the coast was clear. We have learned the true m usefulness of scouts from reading about the Transvaal Wall, but it was all still in the hush of evening sunset on the Roman ruin. We posted sentries who were to lie on their stomachs on the walls and give a long, low, signifying whistle if aught approached. Then we dug a tunnel. Sorry, I'm just moving my microphone so it's a little closer so you hear me above the sound of the rain. Then we dug a tunnel like the one we once did after treasure, when we happened to bury a boy. It took some time, but never shall it be said that a bastable grudged time or trouble when a lark was at stake. We put the things in as naturally as we could and shoved the dirt back. Till everything looked just as before, then we went home, late for tea, but it was in a good cause and there was no hot toast, only bread and butter, which does not get cold with waiting. 
That night, Alice whispered to Oswald on the stairs as we went up to bed, meet me outside your door when the others are asleep. Hissed, not a word. Oswald said, no kid. And she replied in the affirmation, no kid, no kidding. So he kept awake by biting his tongue and pulling his hair, for he shrinks from no pain if it is needful and right. And when the others all slept the sleep of innocent youth, he got up and went out, and there was Alice, dressed. She said, I found some broken things that look ever so much more Roman. They were on the top of the cupboard in the library. If you'll come with me, we'll bury them just to see how surprised the others will be. It was a wild and daring act, but Oswald did not mind. He said, wait half a shake, and he put on his knickerbockers and jacket, and slipped a few peppermints into his pocket, in case of catching cold. It is these thoughtful expedients which mark the born explorer and adventurer. It was a little cold, but while in the white moonlight... Sorry, just burping. It was a little cold, but the white moonlight was very fair to see, and we decided we'd do some other daring moonlight act some other day. We got out of the front door, which is never locked, till Albert's uncle goes to bed at twelve or one, and we ran swiftly and silently across the bridge and through the fields to the Roman ruin. Alice told me afterwards she should have been afraid if it had been dark, but the moonlight made it as bright as day as in your dreams. Oswald had taken the spade and a sheet of newspaper. We did not take all the pots Alice had found, but just the two that weren't broken. Two crooked jugs made of stuff like flower pots are made of. We made two long cuts with the spade and lifted the turf up, turf up and scratched the earth under and took it out very carefully in handfuls onto the newspaper till the hole was deepish. Then we put in the jugs and filled it up with earth and flattened the turf over. Turf stretches like elastic. This we did a couple of yards from the place where the mound was dug into by the men and we had been so careful with the newspaper that there was no loose earth about. They really had thought this one through. Then we went home in wet moonlight. At least the grass was very wet. Probably from dew. Chuckling through the peppermint and got up to bed without anyone knowing a single thing about it. The next day the antiquities came. It was a jolly hot day and the tables were spread under the trees on the lawn like a large and very grand Sunday school treat. There were dozens of different kinds of cake and bread and butter, both white and brown, and gooseberries and plums and jams and jam sandwiches. And the girls decorated the tables with flowers, blue larkspur and white Canterbury bells. And at about, and at about three there was a noise of people walking in the road and presently... The antiquities began to come in at the front gate and stood about on the lawn by twos and threes and sixes and sevens, looking shy and uncomfy, exactly like a Sunday school treat. Presently some gentlemen came who looked like teachers. They were not shy and they came right up to the door. So Albert's uncle, who had not been too proud to be up in our room with us watching the people on the lawn through the netting of our short blinds, said, I suppose that's the committee. Come on. So we all went down. We were in our Sunday things and Albert's uncle received the committee like a feudal system system like a feudal system baron. And we were his retainers. He talked about dates and king posts and gables and mullions and foundations and records and Sir Thomas Thomas Wyatt and poetry and Julius Caesar and Roman remains and lich gates and churches and dog's tooth moulding till the brain of Oswald reeled. I suppose that Albert's uncle remarked that all our mouths were open, which is a sign of reels in the brain, for he whispered, go hence and mingle unsuspected with the crowd. So we went out onto the lawn, which was now crowded with men and women and one child. This was a girl. She was fat, and we tried to talk to her, though we did not like her. She was covered in red velvet, like an armchair, but she, but she wouldn't talk to us. We thought at first she was from a deaf and dumb asylum, where her kind teachers had only managed to teach the afflicted to say yes and no. But afterwards we knew better, because Noel heard her say to her mother, I wish you hadn't brought me, Mamma. I didn't have a pretty teacup, and I haven't enjoyed my tea one bit. And she had had five pieces of cake, besides little cakes, and nearly a whole plate of plums. 
and there were only 12 pretty teacups altogether. Several grown-ups talked to us in a most uninterested way and then the president read a paper about the moat house, which we couldn't understand. And other people made speeches we couldn't understand either, except the part about kind hospitality, which made us not know where to look. Then Dora and Alice and Daisy and Miss, Mrs Pettigrew poured out the tea and we handed cups and plates. Albert's uncle took me behind a bush to see him tear what was left of his hair when he had found there were 123 antiquities present and I heard the president say to the secretary that tea always fetched them. So if you want the antiquities to turn up, you serve tea. Then it was time for the Roman ruin and our hearts beat high as we took our hats, it was exactly like Sunday, and joined the crowded procession of eager antiquities. Many of them had umbrellas and overcoats, though the weather was fiery and without a cloud. That is the sort of people they were. The ladies all wore stiff bonnets and no one took their gloves off, though of course it was quite in the country and it is not wrong to take your gloves off there. We had planned to be quite close when the digging went on, but Albert's uncle made us a mystic sign and drew us apart. Then he said, the stalls and dress circle are for the guests. The host and hostesses retire to the gallery, whence I am credibly informed an excellent view may be obtained. I wonder if Albert's uncle's got something odd going on as well. So we all went up to the Roman walls and thus missed the cream of the lark, for we could not exactly see what was happening, but we saw that things were being taken from the ground as the men dug and passed round for the antiquities to look at, and we knew they must be our Roman remains, but the antiquities did not seem to care for them much, though we heard sounds of pleased laughter. And at last Alice, said, Alice and I managed... And at last Alice and I exchanged meaning glasses... Gla but at last Alice and I exchanged meaning glances when the spot was reached where we had put in the extras. Then the crowd closed up thick and we heard excited talk and we knew we really had sold the antiquities this time. Presently the bonnets and coats began to spread out and trickle towards the house and we were aware that all would soon be over. So we cut home the back way, just in time to hear the president saying to Albert's uncle, A genuine find. Most interesting. Oh, really, you ought to have one. Well, if you insist. And so, by slow and dull degrees, the thick sprinkling of antiquities melted off the lawn. The party was over, and only the dirty teacups and plates and the trampled grass and the pleasures of memory were left. We had a very beautiful supper out of doors too, with jam sandwiches and cakes and things that were over. And as we watched the setting monarch of the skies, I mean the sun, Alice said, let's tell. We let the dentist tell because it was he who hatched the lark, but we helped him a little in the narrating of the fell plot, because he has yet to learn how to tell a story straight from the beginning. When he had done, and we had done, Albert's uncle said, well, it amused you, and you'll be glad to learn that it amused your friends, the antiquities. Didn't they think they were Roman? Daisy said. They did in the Daisy chain. Not in the least, said Albert's uncle, but the treasurer and secretary were charmed by your ingenious preparations for their reception. We didn't want them to be disappointed, said Dora. They weren't, said Albert's uncle. Steady on with those plums, eh, Joe, a little way beyond the treasure you had prepared for them. They found two specimens of real Roman pottery, which sent every man jack of them home, thanking his stars he had been born a happy, happy little antiquary child. Those were our jugs, said Alice, and we really have sold the antiquities. She unfolded the tale about our getting the jugs and burying them in the moonlight, and the mound, and the others listened with deeply respectful interest. We really have done it this time, haven't we? She added in tones of well-deserved triumph. But Oswald had noticed a queer look about Albert's uncle from almost the beginning of Alice's recital, and he now had the sensation of something being up, which has on other occasions frozen his noble blood. The silence of Albert's uncle now froze it yet more arctically. Haven't we, repeated Alice, unconscious of what her sensitive brother's delicate feelings had already got hold of. We have done it this time, haven't we? 
Since you ask me thus pointedly, answered Albert's uncle at last, I cannot but confess that I think you have indeed done it. Those pots on the top of the library cupboard are Roman pottery. The amphora which you hid in the mound are probably, I can't say for certain, mind, priceless. They are the property of the owner of this house. You have taken them out and buried them. The president of the Maidstone Antiquarian Society has taken them away in his bag. Now, what are you going to do? Alice and I did not know what to say or where to look. The others added to our pained position by some ungenerous murmurs about our not being so jolly clever as we thought ourselves. There was a very far from pleasing silence. Then Oswald got up. He said, Alice, come here a sec. I want to speak to you. As Albert's uncle had offered no advice, Oswald disdained from asking him for any. Alice got up too, and she, she and Oswald went into the garden and sat down on the bench under the quince tree and wished they had never tried to have a private lark of their very own with the antiquary antiquities, a private sale, Albert's uncle called it afterwards, but regrets, as nearly always happens, were vain. Something had to be done. But what? Oswald and Alice sat in silent desperateness, and the voices of the gay and careless others came to them from the lawn, where, heartless in their youngness, they were playing tag. I don't know how they could. Oswald would not like to play tag when his brother and sister were in a hole, but Oswald is an exception to some boys. <laughs> yes, this is Oswald writing the story. But Dickie told me afterwards he thought it was only a joke of Albert's uncle. The dusk root grew dusker, till you could hardly tell the quinces from the leaves, and Alice and Oswald still sat exhausted with hard thinking. But they could not think of anything, and it grew so dark that the moonlight began to show. Then Alice jumped up, just as Oswald was opening his mouth to say the same thing, and said, Of course, how silly, I know, come on in, Oswald, and they went on in. Oswald was still far too proud to consult anyone else, but he just asked, carelessly if Alice and he might go into Maidstone the next day to buy some wire netting for a rabbit hutch and to see after one or two things. Albert's uncle said certainly and they went by train with the bailiff from the farm who was going in about some sheep dip and to buy pigs. At any other time Oswald would not have been able to bear leaving the bailiff without seeing the pigs bought but now was different for he and Alice had the weight of the, on their bosoms of being thieves without having meant it, and nothing, not even pigs, had power to charm the young but honourable Oswald till that stain had been wiped away. So he took Alice to the secretary of the Maidstone Antiquities home, house, and Mr Turnbull was out, but the maidservant kindly told us where the president lived. Instead of the secretary... And ere long the trembling feet of the unfortunate brother and sister vibrated on the spotless gravel of Camperdown Villa. When they asked, they were told that Mr Longchamp was at home. Then they waited, paralysed with undescribed emotions, in a large room with books and swords and glass bookcases with rotten-looking odds and ends in them. Um, the doors on them were glass. Mr Longchamp was a collector, that means he stuck to anything, no matter how ugly and silly, if only it was old. He came in, rubbing his hands, and very kind. He remembered us very well, he said, and asked what he could do for us. Oswald, for once, was dumb. He could not find words in which to own himself the ass he had been. But Alice was less delicately moulded. She said... Oh, if you please, we are most awfully sorry, and we hope you'll forgive us, but we thought it would be such a pity for you and all the other poor dear antiquities to come all that way and then find nothing Roman, so we put some pots and things in the barrow for you to find. So I perceived, said the President, stroking his white beard and smiling most agreeably at us, a harmless joke, my dear. Youth's the season for jesting. There's no harm done. Pray think no more about it. It's very honourable of you to come up and apologise, I'm sure. His brow began to wear the furrowed, anxious look of one who would fain be rid of his guests and get back to what he was doing before they interrupted him. 
Alice said, we didn't come for that, it's much worse. Those were two real, true Roman jugs you took away. We put them there. They aren't ours. We didn't know they were real Roman. We wanted to sell the antiquities, I mean antiquaries, and we were sold ourselves. This is serious, said the gentleman. I suppose you'd know the jugs if you saw them again? Anywhere, said Oswald, with the confidential rashness of... I think he means confident. Confidential rashness of one who does not know what he is talking about. Mr Longchamp opened the door to a little room leading out of the one we were in and beckoned us to follow. We found ourselves amid shelves and shelves of pottery of all sorts and two whole shelves, small ones, were filled with the sort of jug we wanted. Well, said the President, with a veiled menacing sort of smile like a wicked cardinal, which is it? Oswald said, I don't know. Alice said, I should know if I had it in my hand. The President patiently took the jugs down one after another and Alice tried to look inside them and one after another she shook her head and gave them back. At last she said, you didn't wash them. Mr Longchamp shuddered and said no. Then, said Alice, there is something written with lead pencil inside both jugs. I wish I hadn't. I would rather you didn't read it. I didn't know it would be a nice old gentleman like you would find it. I thought it would be the younger gentleman with the thin legs and the narrow smile. The President seemed to recognise... Mr Turnbull, the President seemed to recognise the description unerringly. Well, well, boys will be boys, girls, I mean. I won't be angry. Look at all the jugs and see if you can find yours. Alice did, and the next one she looked at, she said, this is one, and two jugs further on, she said, this is the other. Well, the President said, these are certainly the specimens which I obtained yesterday. If your uncle will call on me, I will return them to him. But it is a disappointment. Yes, I think you must let me look inside. He did, and at the first one, he said nothing. At the second, he laughed. Well, well, he said, you can't expect it. we can't expect old heads on young shoulders. You're not the first who went forth to shear and return, Sean. Nor, it appears, am I. Next time you have a sale of antiquities, take care that you yourself are not sold. Good day to you, my dear. Don't let the incident prey on your mind, he said to Alice. Bless your heart. I was a boy once myself, unlikely as you may think it. Goodbye. We were in time to see the pigs bought, after all. I asked Alice what on earth it was she'd scribbled inside the beastly jugs, and she owned that just to make the lark complete, she had written sucks in one of the jugs, and sold again, silly, in the other. But we know well enough who it was that was sold, and if ever we have any antiquities to tea again, they shan't find so much as a Greek waistcoat button if we can help it. Unless it's the president, for he did not behave at all badly. For a man of his age, I think he behaved exceedingly well. Oswald can picture a very different scene having been enacted over those rotten pots if the president had been an otherwise sort of man. But that picture is not pleasing, so Oswald would not, will not distress you by drawing it for you. You can most likely do it easily for yourself. And that's the end of that chapter. And I'm going to finish there. So next time we shall be reading The Would-Be Goods by Edith Nesbitt. The Would-Be Goods being The Further Adventures of the Treasure Seekers. And we'll be reading Chapter 11, The Benevolent Bar. Whatever that means. So I'm going to go, but before I go, you can have a look at those links which I've given you. Discord is our server where we can chat about things. If you have any ideas about further books to read that are old, old ones for children... Um, please let me know there. Uh, also, if you find out where this house was, if it is a real place, you can share a snapshot of the map showing whereabouts in England it was. Um, I would guess that the house itself is possibly not there any longer if it was a real place. Any, any other pictures, illustrations that you think might be connected with this sort of thing or that remind you of the story, please feel free to share them over there too. And otherwise, if you want to hear more of the stories that I have been reading over the last number of months, because I've been reading for a year and a half now, but not all of that time, then 
please have a look at my channel on YouTube and you'll there find playlists for each of the books that I have read. Millie Molly Mandy, The Wind in the Willows, Alice in Wonderland, Alice's, Alice's Adventures, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, what else? The Secret Garden, The Little Princess. I'm sure there's others, the treasure, the treasure seekers, the would be goods, the treasure of the Isle of Mist. Now that's a slightly odd one, set in Scotland. Anyway, all sorts over there. Please go and enjoy reading, listening to them. Bye.